Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and I guess I should say good morning and good evening as well as we have folks attending from around the world. Uh, I'm Sudit Parikh, and I have the privilege of serving as the Chief Executive Officer of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the Executive Publisher of the Science Family of Journals. Uh, I wanna thank you so much for joining us today for the 2021 AAAS Charles Valentine Riley Memorial Lecture. Uh, it is my honor to welcome you to the lecture. Uh, along with our honorees and lecturers, uh, Dr. Andrew P. Dobson of Princeton University, Dr. X.J. Meng of Virginia Tech, and Dr. James A. Roth of Iowa State University. Alongside our esteemed moderator, uh, Dr. Ilaria Kapua. Uh, the AAAS, for those of you who don't know us, is the world's largest multidisciplinary scientific society and a leading publisher of cutting edge research. Uh, we were founded in 1848, which means that for 173 years, we've been seeking to advance science, engineering, and innovation throughout the world for the benefit of all people. Uh, or said simply, we want to advance science and serve society. Now, the theme of today's program is zoonotic diseases and the role of agricultural research in preventing future pandemics. And uh, sitting here in Washington, D.C., uh, in my office, I can think of no challenge for which the benefits of science and innovation are more urgently needed. Uh, COVID-19 has fundamentally changed how we live our lives and is going to require the combined efforts of scientists, governments, and all sectors of the global economy to address it. Um, you know, I've come to appreciate uh, these, the technology of being able to reach out around the world uh, for uh, for webinars and, and lectures like this. Uh, but I, I do miss uh, being in the same room together, uh, being able to shake hands with one another, uh, being able to uh, break bread with one another. And uh, I look forward uh, to being able to, uh, to go back to that uh, with the lessons that we've learned during the pandemic so that we can also uh, reach out in these with these technologies as well. So uh, we have a lot to do to address uh, the pandemic. The CDC estimates that more than six out of every 10 known infectious diseases in people can be spread from animals. And three out of every four new or emerging infectious diseases in people come from animals. People come into direct or indirect contact with infected animals or germs, uh, maybe vector, food, or waterborne. Uh, science has demonstrated that agricultural intensification and environmental change are associated with an increased risk of the emergence, the re-emergence, and the spread of zoonotic disease, and therefore the potential for pandemics. Now the AAAS and the Science Family of Journals uh, have covered and will continue to highlight research addressing the environmental, biological, economic, and social dimensions of zoonotic pathogen emergence. Uh, improving our ability to predict, prevent, and respond to emerging diseases. We're also going to continue to share information about vaccine development and safety, which are an integral part of our mission to serve science and society. Uh, now, I know that you're all eager to hear the thoughts of our lecturers on these and other questions, uh, but I want to take just a few more minutes to thank our partners uh, in this work. First, I'd like to thank uh, Kathy Wotecki, president of the Charles Valentine Riley Memorial Foundation, which is committed to promoting a broader and more complete understanding of agriculture and to building upon Charles Valentine Riley's legacy as a whole picture person uh, with a vision for enhancing agriculture through scientific knowledge. And as a side note, I'd just like to uh, congratulate Kathy for being named to the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology or PCAST uh, bringing this view, this worldview to that, um, to that advisory body uh, is so important. I'm so glad to see it. Uh, this lecture also builds on a long history of association between the AAAS and Mr. Riley himself, uh, who was vice president of our biology section in 1888. Uh, we've been at this for a long time. Our shared mission of promoting science and innovation to benefit all people is just as strong today as it was then. And we are so proud to have the Charles Valentine Riley Memorial Foundation as a partner. Uh, in August 
uh, Dr. Watecki and the Raleigh Memorial Foundation convened a roundtable with representatives from 11 federal agencies that conduct and sponsor research related to zoonotic diseases to share important information about priorities, funding levels, and opportunities for transformational changes to their roles and responsibilities in this area of research. Uh, a summary from the roundtable was, was released this morning and we're gonna be honored to have Dr. Watecki join us today to share more information about the roundtable and their key findings. I'd also like to extend our appreciation and gratitude to the leadership of AAAS's Section O. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Section O is, Section O is Agriculture, Food, and Renewable Resources, uh, and its secretary, uh, Lisa Ainsworth. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, and then finally, I'd like to thank Barbara Stinson, president of the World Food Prize Foundation, our other partner in the lecture. The World, Food Pride, the World Food Prize Foundation's fundamental goal is to support efforts toward an adequate supply and availability of nutritious food for the, for the world population in the 21st century. Uh, with that, uh, let's, let's turn to Dr. Wotecki uh, and, uh, and hear about the, the round table and, uh, and her remarks. Thank you, Dr. Wotecki. Well, thank you, Sudip. Uh, and uh, I would like to add my congratulations to this year's lectures and also to welcome the audience uh, from around the United States and around the world to this year's AAAS Charles Valentine Riley Lecture. Uh, as Sudip already uh, introduced, uh, Charles Valentine Riley to you, I'll, I'll just note that he was among the leading scientists of his time and, and also a, a very active member in AAAS. Uh, the foundation that bears his name endowed this lecture to bring visibility to the importance of agriculture as one of science, society's most fundamental endeavors. And in addition, in addition to this annual lecture that uh, is conducted uh, on, on the, through this uh, endowment to AAAS, the foundation also convenes an annual meeting with leaders in the executive branch and Congress, the private sector and academia to discuss issues related to agricultural research and publishes an occasional report from roundtable discussions. And as you've already heard, we will be releasing today um, one of those occasional publications. And I'm afraid my screen is not advancing. Uh, since I'm unable to advance the screen, I'll just go ahead. Um, and let you know that uh, the roundtable discussion focused on the theme of this year's lecture, uh, zoonotic diseases and the role of agricultural research in preventing future pandemics. Uh, the current pandemic that we're living through uh, has heightened attention to zoonotic diseases, both in scientific circles, as well as in policy circles. And since since entering office, um, let me, there we go. Thank you. Um, since entering office, President Biden has issued three executive orders to agencies within the federal government to strengthen pandemic response and global security. And a new center is being established at the Centers for Disease Control to focus on the data science necessary to combat future pandemics. In June, leaders of the G7 countries announced the 100 days mission to improve readiness for future pandemics. And earlier this month, the Biden administration released its American Pandemic Preparedness Plan, one element of which is actions to ensure situational awareness about infectious disease threats for both early warning purposes and real-time monitoring. The focus of these efforts is, is twofold, earlier detection of emerging diseases, preparedness, as well as faster public health response. As we're planning 
this lecture uh, many months ago, we became aware of the lack of information, up-to-date information about the US government's research and development priorities for and funding of zoonotic disease research. So we convened a roundtable discussion among the federal agencies that sponsor, conduct, or coordinate zoonotic disease research. The result is the brief summary of that discussion that we're releasing today, and you can find it at the link uh, that's listed there at the bottom of the screen at rileymemorial.org. The findings uh, in that report, I'll, I'm going to briefly summarize, starting with the next slide. There are at least 13 agencies in nine different federal departments, along with the Executive Office of the President's Office of Science and Technology Policy, that are involved in some way in either sponsoring or conducting within their intramural laboratories or coordinating zoonotic disease research. Their program priorities are tied to their departmental missions. And they run the full gamut from furthering our basic understanding of these organisms to protecting the food supply, to preparation and response to outbreaks of human as well as animal diseases, and into the areas of biodefense. Agencies find it difficult, though, to actually define the limits of their zoonotic disease research programs as well as to quantify the level at which they are funding that research within their agency budgets. The reason for this is that the programs are really cross-cutting. They go from research into surveillance and monitoring, and they were unable as a result to, to really put a specific number on the research that component of, of those programs. So as a result, we were unable to come up with a single number for what the current level of investment is at the federal level. Coordination occurs at multiple level. Uh, the Office of Science and Technology Policy has overall responsibility. The president's national biodefense strategy provides a framework for that uh, uh, coordination uh, role. And there is a standing interagency working group that has really been uh, very uh, important over the years in coordinating research. And it's called the Foreign Animal Disease Threat Interagency Working Group. Through the course of the discussion over two days, the agencies also came up with lots of different examples of how they collaborate between agencies and among agencies as they conduct these very important research programs. We also learned that there are some new opportunities for funding. Um, one uh, that I might note is the science program that's associated with a new facility that's been constructed in, in Kansas, the National Bio and Agro Defense Facility. And also under the American Rescue Plan Act, there's funding for SARS-CoV-2 monitoring and surveillance within susceptible animals. It's a major infusion of new grant funds into that area. We learned, as you can see on this slide, that there are eight diseases that form the current priorities. Um, this list was established in 2017 and comes from a workshop that the Centers for Disease Control convened among federal scientists. The list can, uh, contains zoonotic flu viruses as well as the emerging coronaviruses and others like salmonellosis, plague, and, and rabies. The roundtable discussion also identified a number of gaps in our current capabilities. And right at the top of that list is prediction, the ability to predict the next zoonotic organism with pandemic potential. Uh, a lack of understanding of how large that reservoir of pathogens is in wildlife with, with capabilities to infect people. Um, a lack of understanding as well of the potential for transmission from companion animals to people. Uh, the number of pets in this country, as well as the number of exotic animals that have become companion animals, 
has, has increased really dramatically and, and understanding the role that companion animals play is, is uh, also considered to be a, a gap by, by this group. Workforce development was something that they identified as being important, having the, the skilled workforce within these agencies capable of doing this kind of research and applying it in emergency uh, situations. And finally, access to farms came up. Um, when there is uh, an emerging problem, to do the kind of research that needs to be done on site is sometimes uh, a gap. Finally, the roundtable participants identified some transformational changes that are needed to detect and to predict uh, emerging zoonotic diseases. Um, among them were investing in early threat identification, building on genomic sequencing, environmental monitoring, and data science, creating the capacity to monitor the spread and evolution of pathogens, which involves integrating diagnostics and genome sequencing, improving real-time analytics and forecasting, and providing comprehensive digital resources and screening tools to frontline responders. They also thought it would be transformational if we could actually demonstrate the value of preventing the next pandemic, uh, as well as being able over time to balance the efforts on prevention and early detection versus the throwing resources at the mitigating of risks once one uh, a new organism uh, emerges and, and uh, epidemics become uh, pandemic. So finally, let's look at the last slide. Today, we'll be hearing the views of three distinguished scientists on the role that zoonotic disease research can play in preventing future pandemics. And it's my pleasure to introduce today's distinguished lecturers and, and moderator. First, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Andy Dobson, uh, professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Princeton University. Next, uh, Dr. XJ Meng, uh, director of the Center for Emerging Zoonotic and Arthropod Born Pathogens at Virginia Tech. And then from Dr. Jim Roth, uh, director of the Center for Food Security and Public Health at Iowa State University. And moderating the discussion this afternoon will be Dr. Ilaria Kapwa, who directs the One Health Center of Excellence at the University of Florida. So you will hear in turn from Dr. Dobson, Dr. Meng, and Dr. Roth. And uh, at this point, Dr. Dobson, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm just going to load up my second screen. And let's hope that is it. Yeah, this is it. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a great honor to be here today. So thank you very much. What I'm going to talk about today are, are three different aspects of preventing the next pandemic, the, the ecology, the economics, and evolution. And of course, by the nature of trying to do this in 15 minutes, it's going to be slightly superficial. But the bottom line of what I'm going to talk about is how do we take apart this figure? This figure is essentially the number of global or continental wide pandemics we've seen in the last hundred years, starting off with the, with the Spanish flu at the end of the First World War, and then with various other pathogens appearing through time. And the way this is coded is the number of deaths is on the y-axis. So the higher up the dots are, the bigger the number of deaths. Along the x-axis are the number of years when we didn't have a major outbreak. And then it's color-coded by the number of continents the disease spread to. So plainly, this here is COVID-19. Uh, when I drew this figure, there were obviously less deaths than there are now. The relative size of the dots is the estimate of the cost of the endemic to, to, the, global, the, to the global economy. And, and so we'll talk about that in more detail. Now let's deconstruct this figure a bit more. Underlying it is a pattern that was put together by my friend and colleague from the University of Edinburgh, Mark Woolhouse, who looked at 
the emergence of viruses over the last century. To a good approximation, we get two new viruses every year trying to establish in human populations. Luckily, it's only once every four years or so, roughly the cycle of presidential elections, that we get a new pathogen emerging. But that would mean quite nicely that most presidencies could be defined by the pathogen that passed over during their term in office. But this constant rate is overseen by what appears in that previous glass, and I'll come back to it, more and more of these pathogens being able to establish and take off. And indeed, we can see that in this slightly more complex figure. These are just the data I showed you in the first glass. But what I plotted out is in red, the cumulative number of births since there was a last an outbreak, and in blue, the cumulative number of years of human lives lived since the last outbreak. And you'll notice that the characteristic feature of all these lines of dots is they all seem to go up to a, some sort of threshold and then we get a new outbreak. And those thresholds are getting closer to closer together, which would obviously be the case if we have more and more humans on the planet and we have more and more people having births. So essentially lots of these emergencies are being driven by the size of the human population. The bigger it gets and the faster it reproduces, the more outbreaks we would expect. And although we will differentiate hugely between different peoples around the world and their different social backgrounds and everything, to a virus, you are just a patch of habitat that's dying to be occupied. And the more of those patches of habitats that are out there, the more viruses we're going to see colonizing human populations. The other, just looking at the last 18 months, the pattern we've seen with COVID, a scary warning to all of us, the cumulative number of cases is now up above 100 million, closer to 200 million. The cumulative number of confirmed deaths is over 5 million. That is just direct deaths. It doesn't count in all the people who've been killed or died because they couldn't get to hospital. So this is a huge pandemic. Lots of those people died because they didn't listen to the advice of scientists. And that will be a continued theme, I hope, of this afternoon. The other thing we're going to start off doing with these data is to notice that through time, there are less years without a major epidemic outbreak. The dots here are getting less and less frequent, and the size of the outbreaks we get are getting bigger because, as I said, there are more patches of resources for the viruses out there. So it's getting more expensive and more continents are infected. So with a wonderful group of people, we decided to do a brief sort of economic analysis of that, essentially taking a technique that Larry Summers and his colleagues had developed to look at the cost of influenza epidemics. This was very much with Amy Aldo and Ted Lock Temazidides. Essentially, you try and work out what's the calculated annual probability of having a pandemic, and that's plainly increasing, and what's the average cost each time you have an epidemic. So the baseline expected annual mortality from these viral diseases with a current world population is about 3.3 million people dying each time we have a pandemic. And there's plainly a lot of scatter around that. So we can look at the estimated willingness to pay to prevent mortality. And that varies from country to country. Different insurance agencies in different countries value human life to different levels. So it could be anywhere between 107 odd thousand up to 6.4 million. And then if you look at the number of lives lost, that would give you one estimate of the cost of the epidemic. The other one is to look at global national uh, income, which WHO, sorry, the, the World Bank estimates that, that whenever we get a pandemic, it causes about a 0.6% in, in, in the reduction in, in global national uh, economic output. So if the average value for that was 87 trillion in 2019. The average loss to uh, any outbreak is about 522 billion. So we've observed 28 outbreaks since 1950. The expected number of outbreaks for any year is about 0.4. So the baseline annual expected loss to the global economy from zoonotic diseases is about 212 billion. So that's just the loss to the economy. It doesn't include the costs of deaths, it would triple or quadruple that number. So that gives you an estimate of how much you should spend if you wanted to prevent this happening. So let's look at how you might spend it. Ah, 
And of course, since we're spending, we go to how have we dealt with this? But we have to think about this because although we're worried about COVID and how it detracts attention from uh, other people's egos, COVID isn't the last of these pandemics. As we've seen, there are a whole host of other pandemics likely to come across because they come across with disarming regularity. One of the principal reasons they come across is tropical deforestation. Chopping down a forest exposes people to the pathogens that are in the species that live in those forests. And if we look at a whole range of some of my favorite diseases, Hantavirus, Lysa viva, Ebola, Kianosil forest disease, Nipah virus, all of those have deforestation for the intensification and expansion of agriculture as the underlying cause. So what we tried to do last summer and what we've been expanding on over the last year, we, we did send a paper into Science Advances uh, nearly 15 months ago. It's still in the process of being refereed, which is something else we would like to sort of speed up. If you look in our initial estimate, the total cost of COVID up until uh, June last year was about $11 trillion. It's now somewhere between 30 and $40 trillion. The estimated cost of preventing another pandemic but for the next 10 years would be about 260 billion. How would we spend that? Well, here again, this is the cost of uh, uh, up until last June. It's now three times as big as that. So roughly covers the whole screen. This is the annual prevention. So one tenth of that 260 is 26 billion. How would you spend that each year? Well, you would do it on a mix of things. One is reducing tropical deforestation which we could reduce by 40% for a mere 6 billion. And we get huge benefits to carbon mitigation because of that. We could reduce disease, well, it's been it's done with livestock, 66, uh, 664 million. Monitoring the wild trade, wildlife trade, we spend $5 million on that at the moment. Not even a minute's flicker on the New York Stock Exchange. It's the total amount we spend currently monitoring the global wildlife trade. Increase that 100 times and it might be months better way to sort of detect things. Ending the wild meat trade in China, which is very much about work in progress and is progressing well at the moment, would only cost about 20 billion. So there's a handful of things we could do, which are a tiny cost relative to the huge potential cost of another COVID or even the current COVID. What else could we spend these things are? Well, one thing, uh, the frontline troops. It's a wonderful delusion that that's the medical people, but I would posit that by the time that these pandemics become medical problems with humans being infected, it's too late. We've shown, thanks to our friend that I illustrated earlier, what an abysmal job the politicians do in stopping pandemic. We need to stop it at a much earlier effort than once it reaches the voting public who will follow their often misleading political leaders. So this is a simple graph of the size of population of the different world's countries and the number of veterinary staff, because it's the vets and the wildlife disease biologists that are the first line of defense. An important caveat for this graph is these are all data from FAO. There is no data on the number of vets in China or Russia. Does that mean that there's no data, which I think is the case, or does it just mean there's no veterinarian? I haven't met a sober Russian vet for over 40 years. That one, not very sober one, but that's as many as I've seen as a wildlife biologist over the last 20 years. We can rearrange that data to give you quite a sobering figure. This is essentially what is the ratio of vets against non-veterinary, normal citizens, uh, for all those different countries arranged against area. You can see on average, there's about one vet for every 2,000 people. The US is just about on that line, factor of two less dates that can't with a, less dates per vets per person than Canada, but you know, competing strongly with Venezuela and the UK and, and France. If you've got a sick pet, you're much better in Uruguay, Spain, or the Falkland Islands. But if you're worried about emerging diseases, all these countries in Africa, parts of Southeast Asia and South America are woefully inadequately provided with vets. We desperately need to train more veterinarians. Otherwise, we're missing the people who are most likely to pick up both on diseases in wildlife and diseases spilling over into domestic livestock. The next thing I want to mention is this thing, vaccination. We all think of vaccination as a medical problem. 
I think of it as an ecological problem because it's an experiment we do. And, and all of the, the theory about how vaccination works at the population level actually comes out of population ecology. And what we're trying to do is generate herd immunity by vaccinating people. So as we have a sufficiently large number of people in the population vaccinated, that when an infected person bumps into somebody, they're always vaccinated and they can't spread the infection. And the mathematics underlying this was actually worked out initially. The whole theory of herd immunity was worked out by a guy called Paul Fine, who's at the London School of Tropical Medicine. He trained as a mathematics mathematician as an undergraduate at Princeton. This figure, which is a sort of refinement of some of the things Paul did earlier, was drawn initially by Roy Anderson and Bob May, both of whom are theoretical ecologists, which means it's a mixture of physicists and real ecologists from Princeton and Imperial College. And it essentially says, as the basic reproductive rate, the, the rate of spread of the pathogen gets bigger, the proportion of hosts you have to vaccinate to achieve herd immunity gets larger. Very simple formula under name size that. We hugely know what it is for measles from all of Paul's work and Roy's and my colleague Brian Grenfell's work. COVID doesn't have such a big basic reproductive rate, so we don't need to have to get vaccination rates high enough. But as it gets more transmissible, we're probably going to have to get vaccination levels up to 70, 80% to achieve herd immunity, perhaps even higher because of spatial heterogeneity. We have done a marvelous job vaccinating people, but notice the US has slipped behind other nations. They've overtaken them despite our early start. And that is because of some other huge problem that ever epidemic, and that's misinformation. Having people not get vaccinated because they've been misinformed or given the wrong information is, to my mind, criminal. It should be prosecuted. We can see if things like that going on in North Carolina. This is data I found yesterday on the web. If we look just for the last month in North Carolina, out of 28, 27,000 cases of COVID, 85% were people who were not fully vaccinated. Out of the 1,500 people who went into hospital, because of COVID, 71% were not fully vaccinated. Out of the 611 deaths, 75% were not fully vaccinated. Yeah. Getting vaccinated is a no-brainer, both for your own health and for stopping the spread into other people. Now, let's look at this figure, because this figure emphasizes how fantastic the science has been behind COVID. This was a figure put together quite early on in the uh, COVID epidemic by, by Trevor Bedford wonderfully skilled geneticist. Uh, in fact, Trevor won both the MacArthur Award and um, a Howard Hughes Award this week on, on Tuesday, so he's had a good week. Uh, he's one of the two people I really trust if we want to understand the genetics uh, of COVID. The other would be Eddie Holmes in Sydney and Australia. This is early on in the epidemic when the handfuls of mutations gave us different strains that allowed us to track the, the spread, which again showed how late and often misguided attempts to stop spread by politicians were it quickly spread around the world, it doesn't yet tell us about selection for changes in virulence. We need uh, a subtly different set of theory to look at that. But uh, again, politicians did exactly the wrong thing. If you want to understand how to control a virus uh, that's evolving rapidly, why put a fundamentally religious person in charge of it who doesn't even believe in religion? And it doesn't even believe in evolution. That's a fundamentally wrong step in my book. Um, these are finches uh, infected by a bacterial infection, which infects their eyes. So you can see uh, them getting steadily worse as the disease progresses. Why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting because the dynamics of this disease are very similar to the dynamics of COVID. On the x-axis, is the level of symptoms we see, which we can measure by that the severity of that I score. On the vertical axis is the transmission potential, which we get by experiments by exposing susceptible birds to the infected birds. Notice that the transmission goes on before the symptoms appear. By the time the symptoms appear, the disease is actually less transmissible. And that's very similar to COVID. It goes back to a very fantastic early book that Christoph Fraser and Roy Anderson, a bunch of people looked at. If we look at how to control diseases in humans, we can divide them up into two different uh, population characteristics. The proportion of infections that occur prior to symptoms or by asymptomatic infection 
and the basic reproductive rate, their transmissibility. And straight around this figure, you can see SARS, which was the first coronavirus to really upset the globe, was something that didn't really transmit until symptoms appeared. Smallpox, the only human diseases we've eradicated by vaccination, again, doesn't transmit much before symptoms appear. Influenza and HIV, even they might have lower r noughts because so much transmission goes on before symptoms appear, they're almost impossible to control. COVID is around here, 20 to 40% of transmission before uh, symptoms appear, and with r naught getting progressively bigger as new strains emerge. So we can look at that mathematically, it's very similar, it's identical, the, the algebra doesn't differentiate between viruses and bacteria. We can look at the evolution of virulence in such a system, where all we're interested in is what happens if transmission occurs before symptoms appear, what happens if transmission occurs after symptoms appear, and there's a relative proportion of transmission either before or after symptoms appear. You can write down an expression for R0, and then you can solve this uh, analytically to say, well, what is the equilibrium level of virulence or relative virulence, depending on whether transmission occurs before symptoms occur or afterwards? And the scary thing there is the earlier the transmission occurs before symptoms appear, then the level of virulence will get significantly higher than if transmission occurs once virulence is expressed. And that's a very general result. Expressing another classic biological principle, if you want to keep something secret, publish it. So we wrote that actually 10 years ago or more, more than that. We see exactly that as predicted happening in the, with the bacteria in the finches. It gets worse in the area where it first established. Once it spread to the west coast, it got worse and the virulence steadily builds up. The second reason it builds up is because as herd immunity appears in the host population, that selects the pathogen to get round the immunity that's already in there. And that is synonymous with it also becoming more virulent. So a message from the birds is once herd immunity begins to make its presence known, COVID will start competing with the immune population it has created. This will place selection pressure on the virus to change. Transmission before virulence express always selects for increased virulence. It's also likely that immunity will select for asymmetrical immunity in some way. And that has interesting implications for the development of future vaccines. So what have I tried to say? Now, earlier figures that, an apology, you, you, you didn't see because I wasn't told you couldn't see the slides, that annually it's gonna cost only about 30 billion a year to prevent the next pandemic, but that next pandemic is inevitable. We should spend that money on stopping tropical deforestation, stopping the wildlife trade, and investing in much better ways to monitor the viruses out. It would only cost about 10 billion to develop a global viral project. And a, a fantastic paper in PLOS Biology on Tuesday by Daniel Stryker's group in Glasgow would give us a fantastic way of identifying which of those other viruses out there are likely to be the next COVID. If we to plot that out in the way we tend to do things, there are six different stages of disease emergence, from pre-emergence when it's circulated in the wild, the initial spinover emergence to global pandemics. This is, again is this paper that's been interminably in view in one of AAAS's wonderful journals. Uh, the proportion of pathogens that make it through this is less and less and less. The cost of stopping it and the cost to society is more and more. So much, much better to spend the money early and spend it late. And it's easy to do this. And the cost benefit analysis is a total no brainer. Another key thing is stopping this is an international operation. We can't think of this as policy for the US alone. That is a no brainer. Having international trade and tourism is synonymous with international pandemics unless you want to assume that the trade within the US is a totally internal and there's no contact with other countries, uh, which this idiot did suggest was a way to go, you have got to interact with other, other international co companies such as WHO, PAHO, FAO, and Rome. And all of the scientists who interact anyway have got to continue to be able to do that. 
again, I'd like to thank some wonderful collaborators on this, uh, uh, both on the paper I've, I've mainly discussed, but also on some of the work that led into it. The bottom line is if we want to stop this happening again, we have to put money into stopping the wildlife trade. We have to stop wildlife consumption. We have to stop destroying tropical forests. We've got to hire many, many vets as they're the frontline troops. Thank you. It's been a great honor to speak to you. And I think my task is to, to introduce the next speaker uh, and, and to stop sharing my screen. Yeah, uh, XJ will be the next speaker. So I'm going to hand the baton to him. Okay, I think this should work now. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it is an honor and a privilege uh, to be one of the speaker for the Roddy Memorial Lecture this year. So I'd like to thank uh, the Triple AS and uh, the Roddy Memorial Foundation and the World Food Prize Foundation for the opportunities. So what I'm trying to do here today in this uh, 15 minutes uh, is to briefly discuss with you uh, the important role of One Health in solving the complex problem of emerging zoonotic disease. Now, One Health is the concept that human, animal, and the environment we live in are inseparably linked together. So in order to have a healthy human, we must also have a healthy animals and a healthy environment. So the One Health recognized the interdependence of the human, animal, and their environment and they utilize the holistic approach to solve some of the complex uh, global health issues like zoonotic disease. So this slide is from the 2017 publication, I believe from Dr. Tony Fudge's group at the NIH, uh, showing some of the examples of emerging, re-emerging infectious disease worldwide. And as you can see, this disease are caused almost exclusively by viruses and bacteria. Uh, they are distributed worldwide. Uh, you probably can immediately recognize some of the emerging diseases such as SARS and MERS and the 2009 uh, H1N1 pandemic flu, or some of the re-emerging diseases such as West Nile, Zika, and Ebola. Now, many of these emerging diseases are one health problems, which require us to address not only the human health issue, but also the animal health and the environmental health. Now, showing here are four recent examples of emerging viral disease. And, and, and you know, the first thing we typically see, uh, especially in the eyes of the general public, is the human suffering of this deadly emerging disease. Uh, for example, the 2004 West Africa Ebola outbreaks killed more than 11,000 people. And the 2003 SARS outbreak has a very high mortality rate, uh, killed more than 770 people. Uh, the 2012 MERS outbreak spread to uh, 27 countries very quickly and killed more than 850 people. And, and of course, uh, uh, the 2009 H1, H1M1 pandemic flu, which we know very well, uh, infected more than 16 million Americans uh, with more than 12,000 deaths uh, just in the United States alone during just the first year of the pandemic. So clearly these are major public health disease with deadly consequences. Now we clearly can see the human devastation caused by this emerging infectious disease. The critical issue facing us today is that we are not doing enough to adequately address the root cause of all these emerging infections, uh, which are the animal and the environment. So this slide shows some of the recent example of zoonotic viral disease, including the four examples I showed you in the last slides. 
Uh, you can see here, these are all zone nodivirus disease with animal reservoir, uh, which include both wildlife, uh, such as bat, uh, cat, uh, bird, and, and, and deer mice, but also domestic animals, such as pig and horses. And for example, take a look at this source uh, 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 outbreaks in 2003. Uh, the animal reservoir for source is bat, which transmits the virus from uh, from back to the intermediate host, uh, the civet cat, before jump species infecting humans. Uh, another example here is the hepatitis E virus. See here, uh, here we go. It's the hepatitis E virus, which has more than a dozen animal reservoirs and, and, and the virus from pig, a deer and a rat are all known to be zoonotic and infect humans. In fact, the majority of emerging infectious disease in humans came from animals. And about 58% of the more than 1,400 recognized human pathogens are zoonotic. And as for the emerging human pathogen, about three out of every four of them also came from animals. So clearly, uh, animals play a very important role in the emergence of infectious disease. Now, equally important for the emergence of zoonotic disease is the environment we live in. Uh, we, the humans, are to blame for many of the emerging human infections. Uh, some of the human activities, such as climate change, deforestation, uh, intensive animal farming practice, uh, wildlife vet market, all these human activities that bring the animal pathogen closer to the human habitat, leading to spillover and species infections. Uh, for example, climate change can lead to ecological changes of a pathogen carrying vector, uh, such as mosquitoes and pigs, and therefore promoting the transmission, especially those vector-borne disease, uh, such as West Nile and, and, and Lyme disease. Uh, deforestation uh, reduces the habitat of wildlife animals and therefore increases the chances of contact between humans and wildlife, uh, which can consequently lead to spillover infection of humans and intensive animal farming practice. Uh, it can promote rapid spread and the mutation of animal pathogen, uh, which may produce a new strain of pathogen that have the potential to infect the human. So you can see here that human health in the case of emerging zoonotic disease are inseparably, inseparably linked together with the animal health and the environment health. Now, although wildlife are the reservoir for the majority of emerging zoonotic disease in humans, uh, domestic animals, particularly agricultural uh, animals, also play a very important role uh, in the emergence of zoonotic disease. Uh, let's just take a look at one agriculture animal species, uh, the pig, for example. Since 1991, at least 16 emerging viruses have been identified from pig. And some of them, you can see from these slides, the habitats E virus or nipple virus are known to be zoonotic in fact, the human. Now, this is just one animal species, not one type of pathogen, the virus. So you can imagine how many animal pathogens are out there considering the existence of a large number of animal species. So in general, we can classify these emerging viruses from pigs and other animals into three different categories. The category one are the emerging and re-emerging viruses that actually cause economic important disease, uh, such as the post reproductive and respiratory syndrome virus, uh, the post circle virus type two, or the post epidemic diarrhea virus. Now, all these viruses uh, uh, receive a lot of attention, which is rightly so, because they cause economically very important clinical disease in pigs. Now for the category two, uh, these are a group of emerging viruses from pigs and other animals that also infect the human. So these are the zoonotic viruses, uh, such as the hepatitis E virus or H1N1 flu, or the Nipah virus shown here in this slide. So because of their public health implication and their zoonotic risk, these viruses also receive a lot of attention and intensive research effort. The problem we are facing today is the category three viruses. These are a group of emerging viruses with either unknown or uncertain clinical implications uh, in pigs or in humans. Uh, they are considered as the neglected viruses because we don't have the adequate resources to study them. 
So consequently, we know very little about uh, the biology, the pathogenicity, or the zoonotic potential of this category, uh, category three emerging viruses. Now, some of these viruses will con likely continue to evolve and mutate in the pig population. So the existence of a large number of animal pathogens in both wildlife and the domestic animal species really pose a continuous threat uh, for the emergence of a zoonotic disease. So in the remaining time, I'm gonna briefly present you an example of emerging zoonotic disease that requires one health approach for solution. Uh, so I'm gonna use the hepatitis E virus as an example, uh, since uh, I've been studying this virus uh, for more than two decades. Now, hepatitis C is a very important public health and one health disease. Uh, a unique feature of hepatitis C is the high mortality rate in infected pregnant women, which can be up to 25%, even though uh, the overall mortality is less than 1%. The disease is transmitted primarily by fecal oral route or by zoonotic transmission. Uh, chronic hepatitis C and hepatitis C-related neurologic disease have now become a significant clinical problem, uh, especially in those immunocompromised individuals. So the hepatitis C clearly is a, a very important public health disease and a global disease, and with outbreaks occurring, uh, especially in some of those developing countries in Asia and Africa, as you can see here uh, from this map. According to the WHO, each year there are more than 20 million hepatitis C virus infections. And this leads to about 3 million cases of hepatitis C and more than 44,000 hepatitis C related deaths. So clearly, uh, the hepatitis C affects a large number of individuals worldwide and cause tremendous uh, uh, human sufferings. As I mentioned earlier, hepatitis C is the one health problem. Uh, there exists a large number of animal reservoirs for the viruses. And you can see here from this slide, uh, the virus actually has been genetically identified from more than a dozen animal species, uh, including pig, deer, rat, uh, ferret, bat, and even fish, as you can see here from this slide. And so far, the viruses identified from pigs, from deer, from rabbit, and rat have all been shown to be zoonotic and infect humans. And it's likely that novel strain of HIV will continue to be discovered from other animal species in the future. Uh, so the host range of this virus will continue to expand. So clearly animal play an important role in the emergence and zoonotic transmission of the hepatitis C virus. Now, in addition to animals, uh, the environment also play an important role in the transmission of hepatitis C. Uh, for example, uh, pig manure storage facility on pig farms, uh, the drinking water, sewage water, irrigation water, are all reportedly con uh, contaminated by the hepatitis C virus, uh, especially in those developing countries. And, and they can serve as a source for human infections. Uh, and also the HIV contamination have been reported in uh, animal meat products, uh, such as sausage and pork liver, uh, in produce such as strawberry and, and raspberries, and in shellfish, uh, such as oysters. Uh, sporadic and cluster cases of hepatitis C cases have been linked definitively uh, to the consumption of undercooked pork and other animal meat worldwide. So this environmental sources of HIV contamination play a very important role in the zoonotic transmission and of this disease. So clearly uh, hepatitis C is the one health disease and in order to mitigate the human suffering caused by this virus, we must employ the One Health approach uh, to adequately address the large number of animal reservoirs that harbor the virus, and also the environment source of contaminations. So finally, uh, the COVID-19. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is also the One Health problem. We all know the tremendous human suffering from this pandemic, but animals and the environment also play an important role in the pandemic. Uh, even though we do not know the exact animal reservoir of the SARS-CoV-2, uh, we do know for sure that the virus has already been transmitted uh, from infected human to a number of animal species, uh, including mink, uh, cat, dog, tiger, and lion in the zoo setting, and deer. A major concern right now is the potential reverse zoonosis, especially if a mutant version of the virus from animal a transfer back to human, and that will really create problems. 
In addition to the animal, the environment we live in, particularly the air we breathe, uh, the wastewater and the sewage contamination because the uh, SARS-CoV-2 shed in feces also play an important role in, in, in the transmission of COVID-19. So, so COVID-19 is a one health problem and requires uh, uh, cross disciplinary uh, one health approach for solution. Now, SARS-CoV-2 is one of the seven coronavirus that are known to infect human, but likely it will not be the last one. Uh, there are, you can see here, more than uh, 50 known animal coronaviruses infecting a large number of wildlife and domestic animal species. And in fact, spillover infection, or emergence of new coronavirus occur repeatedly in humans and other animal species. And this large number of animal coronavirus will continue to evolve in, in, in different kind of animal species. And unless we do something about them, I would not be surprised if another animal coronavirus jump species and infect human in the future. So, uh, so I'm gonna stop here by leaving you with this quote from Rudolf Virchow, who said back in 1867, uh, not a single year passes without which we can tell the world here's a new disease. More than 150 years later, uh, this statement remained very true. The COVID-19 pandemic really provided a sobering reminder that we will have to uh, take a long and a deep look at the root cause of all these emerging infections and invite resources to address them. Now, thinking of it this way, it will be much more cost effective if we can eliminate or control this so-called animal pathogen in their own animal host before they jump species and infecting us. So I'm gonna stop here and pass on to Dr. Jim Roth. Let's see, let stop sharing here. Uh, let's see here. Okay. All right, I think we're ready to go. Um, so I'm going to, I wanna thank the uh, Charles Valentine Riley Memorial Lecture Committee and the AAAS and the World Food Prize for inviting me to have the opportunity to talk to this group about uh, very important topics. Uh, and I'm going to put a little different emphasis on it. I'm going to emphasize more the threat to the global food security, which is also a public health concern, uh, not to downplay the impact of direct infections in humans, but food security is something we also need to be concerned about. Um, Okay, and uh, Dr. Dobson and Dr. Meng did an excellent job of making the point that we're seeing newly emergent diseases all the time. There's a very impressive list of uh, diseases that have caused problems in the last 40 years, and we're likely to see a similar list in the next 40 years of human diseases that are zoonotic that we uh, aren't aware of now. And the same is true for animals, domestic animals and food animals. We're seeing increased incidence of uh, new diseases emerging, uh, as Dr. Meng mentioned with swine, and also reemergence of old diseases. So we're having to fight uh, infectious diseases more and more all the time uh, in our food production and in our companion animals. <clears throat> And the reasons for this have already been discussed also. And in my mind, the number one reason is the expanding human population. Uh, we've had a rapidly expanding human population for the last 70 or 80 years. Uh, infectious diseases love high concentrations of susceptible individuals that can uh, transmit the diseases among themselves and the disease can then, the virus can mutate, uh, increase in virulence, increase in tr transmissibility. And along with the expanding human population, we've seen a great expansion in production of food animals. Uh, and it's the same thing with more and more food animals, there's more and more opportunity for infectious agents to evolve and mutate and spread. Uh, there are two basic methods for producing more food animals to feed the world. 
One is intensive animal agriculture, which has already been mentioned. The other is increased backyard animal production. Both of these have advantages and disadvantages, and both of them uh, can lead to increased transmission of animal diseases and zoonotic diseases. And I wish we had more time to discuss uh, all of that, but they're, they're both important for producing food and both a risk for uh, infectious diseases. And also it's been mentioned the wildlife, domestic animal, human interactions, which give opportunities for interspecies transfer of pathogens, uh, the impact of environmental degradation, climate change, and globalization, which allows these uh, infectious agents to travel around the globe uh, very rapidly in humans, uh, much less rapidly in domestic animals because we don't allow domestic animals to uh, go from one country to another unless they have health certificates and uh, usually are put in quarantine. So what I want to quickly go through is um, four animal diseases that I think uh, provide important and alarming lessons for us uh, going into the future. The highly pathogenic avian influenza, African swine fever, Nipah virus in swine and Ebola virus in swine. And then of course, we always have to worry about a novel unknown emerging zoonotic disease uh, that may emerge in food producing animals and uh, transfer to people. And then of course, back to the animals. So first highly pathogenic avian influenza virus, the outbreak we had in North America in 2014, 2015. This virus um, had its origins in Asia and wild waterfowl in Asia uh, migrate up to Alaska uh, in, in, the winter, in the summer months. And the Pacific American flyway waterfowl go to the same area. They exchanged viruses and the virus uh, H5N8 from Asia recombined with a low pathogenic H5N2 from North America, creating a brand new virus, an H5N2 uh, avian influenza that had never been seen before. It appeared on the West Coast, West Coast in wild birds, a few commercial poultry, but then it got into the Midwest and produced uh, very severe uh, problems. So um, on April 13th, we had the first case of uh, high pathogenic H5N2 in commercial poultry in Iowa. This is just Iowa. Minnesota and some other states had problems also. And in a two month period from April 13th to June 16th, uh, 31 and a half million poultry in Iowa died because of avian influenza. Most of them were layer hens. We produce uh, about uh, 25 to 30 percent of the eggs for the nation in Iowa. And most of these are in very large production units with very good biosecurity, but not quite good enough because once that one bird in on a facility with three to four million birds gets infected, all of those birds are going to get infected and die or have to be destroyed. So it's 31 and a half million poultry on 77 different farms, infected sites. Six were backyard sites, 71 were large commercial sites. Um, tremendous effort by federal and state authorities and the industry all working together to get this virus stopped and to um, deal with all of the dead birds and to clean up uh, and uh, decontaminate all those facilities. About a $1.2 billion impact on the Iowa economy alone. Now, fortunately, H5N2 was not zoonotic. Uh, if it had been zoonotic, it would have been a much, much worse situation, both to control while everybody has to wear PPE, and there would have been uh, human cases also. So it would have been much, much worse. Now recall that this virus, uh, avian influenza virus came from Asia uh, and entered the US through wild birds migrating up through Alaska. And Asia has a few avian influenza strains that are zoonotic. 
Um, they're in, in the commercial poultry and in the wildfowl, and they occasionally, relatively rarely, fortunately, will, will cross the species barry, barrier and infect people uh, in Asia. And um, some of those have a very high case fatality rate. Now, if one of those zoonotic H5 viruses or avian influenza viruses would make its way to uh, the US, the Midwest, where we have so many poultry and spread like this H5N2 did, uh, that would be very, very serious for uh, human health, food production, and, and the economy. That would be a real disaster. So we need to be paying attention to that um, because it could happen with a, a zoonotic strain. The next example is African swine fever virus that spread um, in 2007 from Africa into Europe and then into Asia, and it's still going on. African swine fever is a non-zoonotic virus of swine uh, that had been limited to sub-Saharan Africa primarily, uh, a few escapes out of Africa that were controlled. Uh, but in 2007, African swine fever entered the country of Georgia, probably through infected garbage from a, a ship being fed to pigs. And it then spread through Western Europe uh, into Russia and Asia. And in 2018, the first case of African swine fever was found in China. And it rapidly spread through China and Southeast Asia. And this oval, uh, in the slide shows where approximately half the pigs in the world are produced. Pork is a, a major uh, food supply for the uh, non-Muslim countries in that region. Um, and it, it is still spreading, it's still a huge problem. They're beginning to get it under control with some biosecurity. There is no vaccine yet. There's a tremendous effort to develop vaccines and it, it is looking a little promising, but we're still a few years away from a vaccine. And then just in July this year, a very alarming event happened and it was discovered in this hemisphere in the Dominican Republic. And then uh, shortly after that, ASF was also discovered in Haiti. So there's a real concern and effort to keep it spreading from Hispaniola to the rest of this hemisphere. But there's a lot of concern that this virus has been very hard to stop. Um, <clears throat> and I showed you that it, uh, half the pigs in the world were produced in that area of China and Southeast Asia. And it's estimated that half of the pigs in that area were killed by African swine fever. Um, and by a year later, the, the price of pork in China had doubled and there was a, a real serious shortage of pork, which is a staple food in China. Now again, ASF is not zoonotic, so that was very fortunate. And it only affects pigs. Uh, it is not known to infect any other species other than swine. So that was a fortunate aspect of it also. But what if it had been, uh, a virus that spreads easily amongst pigs like ASF did and is also zoonotic. And, and that's why I want to talk about Nipah virus, which Dr. Meng had, had also mentioned and Dr. Dobson. Uh, this is an example from Malaysia in 1998 and 1999. Um, in late 1998, it was observed that pigs in Malaysia had a respiratory and neurologic syndrome, and it spread very rapidly among swine by the respiratory route. And then they started noticing that some people working closely with pigs developed encephalitis. Uh, there were more than 250 cases in people, uh, more than 100 deaths. So again, a, a high case fatality rate uh, spread very easily from pig to pig and much less easily from pig to human. Um, in March 1999, a new paramyxovirus was isolated and discovered. Uh, the Malaysian authorities had a very quick national response with assistance, especially from Australia and the U.S., and they very rapidly uh, developed diagnostic testing and they uh, 
called out the army and killed 1.1 million pigs out of a total of 2.4 million in the country. Malaysia did not have a large number of pigs by comparison because it's, it's a Muslim country and many of the population don't eat pork. Now that was very successful. There have been no new cases of Nipah in humans in Malaysia or in swine since 1999. However, almost every year, there are a few cases in people of Nipah virus uh, in Bangladesh and Indira, India. And this is uh, direct transmission from fruit bats to people is believed to be the cause in Bangladesh and India. And there is some evidence for human to human transmission of the Nipah virus, which is quite concerning. Uh, this shows one of the first sites in Malaysia that was infected uh, with Nipah virus in swine. Uh, and this is an area that had not had uh, intensive swine production before and that, uh, an intensive swine farm was built in this area. They had a lot of durian fruit cherries and a lot of fruit bats. And a very rare event occurred in that the virus jumped from the fruit bats shown here on the right into the pigs and then spread rapidly through the pig population. And it spread from this area to other areas because some of the farmers noticed their pigs getting sick and they sold their pigs cheap to other farmers in other parts of the country which spread the virus. This slide shows the uh, distribution of the Teropus genus fruit bats in that part of the world. And there's good evidence that those fruit bats carry the Nipah virus um, and don't get sick. So they're able to carry the virus with no clinical adverse events. But notice uh, that this also includes that area that has 50% of the pigs in the world or had 50% of the pigs in the world. In China, most of the pigs are concentrated in the Southeast. What if the Nipah virus emerged from fruit bats into this pig dense region, spread exactly like it did in Malaysia, uh, very rapidly from pig to pig, or like African swine fever did in China, but is a zoonotic disease with a high case fatality rate. It would be a, a very, very difficult situation to deal with. And, and we've known this for 20 years, that this is a threat. Another swine virus I wanna spend a little more time on is Ebola virus. And this hasn't really been a problem uh, in swine yet, but we know it was discovered in 2009 that pigs in the Philippine were, Philippines were infected with Reston Ebola virus. And the Reston virus is not pathogenic for people. It does infect people, but uh, very little or no clinical signs. And it was accidentally discovered in pigs in the Philippines, uh, and which also, well, they had multiple infections with PERS virus and others. Um, so this was alarming to see that pigs uh, in, a, in a production setting could be infected with the rest and Ebola virus. And then when people look, they found the rest and Ebola virus uh, infecting pigs in China. And serum samples from people working with the pigs in the Philippines had antibodies against the rest and Ebola, which indicated they probably be picked up infection from pigs. So some researchers at the Canadian Food Inspection Agency uh, decided to test whether the Zaire Ebola virus, and this is the one that has caused so many, so much disease and deaths in Africa, uh, would also infect pigs. And they were able to demonstrate that pigs are susceptible to challenge with Zaire Ebola virus and can develop severe respiratory disease, which is transmitted pig to pig. Then they did an experiment with pigs and primates in the same isolation room, but with no direct contact. And they are able to show that pigs can transmit uh, Zaire Ebola virus to non-human primates without direct contact, presumably a respiratory route. So we have a lot of indications and warnings from nature that there are some bad viruses out there we need to be aware of that 
could be even worse than COVID. And there are different, I've sort of categorized zoonotic disease transfer into three different groups. Uh, one example would be a virus coming from some species and a rare event, it jumps into people and then is easily transmitted person to person. And the obvious example here is the size SARS coronavirus 2. And for this type of zoonotic disease, you have to control the virus, the human to human transmission, which is where all of the effort is going with COVID. And that's appropriate. You can't really expect to stop a rare event that we don't fully understand. Another type of zoonotic disease is the type that's primarily an animal disease, easily transmitted to anim between animals and rarely to people. And for this type of disease, because they can produce severe disease in people, the tendency is to want to spend a lot of resources to vaccinate people to prevent it. But for this type of disease, um, I would argue it's much more important and practical to con control it in the domestic animals. And an example here would be Nipah virus in swine. If you can stop it in swine, then they won't transmit to people. And uh, the rabies virus in dogs, which has been going on for decades, trying to control rabies in dogs so they don't transmit to people. So controlling the outbreak. Jim, oh, Jim, I apologize. We wanted to transition to our panel discussion. I apologize for cutting you okay, off. Okay, sure. Um, um, well, we can go ahead and do that. Uh, the last type is where it transmits between everything and you've got to control it in all types. Thank you right. so much. Sure. I'd now like to welcome our other two lecturers, XJ and Andy, back to the floor, as well as our moderator, Elaria. The floor is yours. Hello, and uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank you to our lecturers for such a fantastic overview of how important veterinarians are because I'm a veterinarian and actually I, I, I do believe that um, we need more attention at the human animal interface. And um, I, I have listened with great attention to your presentations and, um, and also to what uh, Kathy Wotecki uh, said earlier on. And, in the sake of, of time and um, of really hearing what your um, ideas are, I think that we can take for granted that we all agree that we lived in a closed system and that there are certain um, unbalances that are created in that closed system. Uh, for example, deforestation. Um, for example, encroachment, for example, intensive animal farming that can alter uh, or that can be altered and that are the trigger to um, emerging infectious diseases which can cause pandemics. So my question for you is, and um, as I said, mentioning what Kathy Wateki said, for each one of you is, um, Kathy mentioned prevention. Uh, prevention as one of the key tools to um, avoid uh, these episodes and of course to avoid future pandemics. So I would like to ask Andy Dobson and then XJ Meng and then Jim Roth to please tell us in a few words because we don't have a lot of time, what are the uh, ways that you would actually, uh, so what would you advise our decision makers uh, to put their money into if they had to prevent emerging infectious diseases from your point of view and from your perspective? Andy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, I, I can't overemphasize the need for prevention. We, we, we've seen with COVID, uh, particularly in the US, in India, in Brazil, in the UK, how badly the politicians manage these things and how they politicize them. So the way to stop it getting that far is to 
use prevention to stop the pathogens before they cross over and investing in that. The key things there, I think, are stopping tropical deforestation, stopping the wildlife trade, and much more intensive monitoring at that sort of agriculture human interface. And to do that, you simply need you know, almost 10 times as many veterinarians as we have now, maybe 100 times in sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world. You know, just, Thank you. Yeah, just quickly add, you know, when it comes to dealing with the zoonotic disease, uh, we as a society are all been kind of in a reactive mode. Only when a zone of disease emerge and spread in the human population, we then try to control the spread through behavior modification or vaccination program. And as I mentioned earlier, it would be much more cost effective if we can somehow stop and eliminate, eliminate those emerging animal pathogens in their own host before they jump species and infect the human. Now, a significant focus right now on the zoonotic disease has been on the transmission uh, from wildlife animal to humans. However, you know, as Andy mentioned and Jim mentioned, many zoonotic disease transmission have an intermediate host of domestic and livestock animals. So I think it'd be very important uh, to invest the resources to study and understand the transmission of animal pathogen uh, from wildlife to uh, a, a domestic animal, and especially in the interface between wildlife and domestic animals. Totally agree. Jim Ross? And I agree with uh, everything that's been said. Uh, I would, there are some diseases that we know are a threat and there could be more research and development now on, on vaccines and prevention for those that, that we know are a threat but it's the ones we don't know that are a threat. And that's where the, the uh, controlling deforestation, environmental degradation, global warming uh, can have an impact, I think. So that we have the known threats and then the things that we know lead to increasing emergence of diseases that should be controlled. Thank you, thank you very much. And let me ask you another question as we wrap, wrap up this um, meeting. Um, so, of course, we are immersed in an ever-changing climate. Um, there are things that are happening around us and that affect our um, everyday lives, uh, but also um, affect um, our long, the long-term sustainability of um, of humans in, in certain parts of the world. And so my question for you is, um, how are zoonotic diseases um, interconnected with climate change? Um, are they uh, two um, connected events or um, are they, can we consider them as disconnected? And are there enough scientists that are looking into climate change and um, disease emergence. Over to you, Andy. Again, I, I think that's a vitally important question, but, but I also worry that, that it's easy to get mis mislaid. Um, big, certainly climate change is a huge problem, but I don't see it as a major driver of emerging diseases. I'm much more worried about diseases that we've had for a long time, such as malaria, and cholera, and climate change and those diseases spreading from the tropics into the temperate zone. That's likely to be a much bigger threat because those pathogens are already a major threat to human uh, morbidity, mortality, etc. The key thing that I think is also important is, is that the best way to stop emerging pathogens is to stop tropical deforestation. That would reduce risk by about 33, 40%. It's also the only solution we have for taking carbon out of the atmosphere. We can all drive our electric cars, turn our lights off. That's just stopping the CO2 coming up. The only thing that takes carbon out of the atmosphere is tropical forests, tropical savannas, and temperate forests and savannas. We have to restore those, and we have to massively protect the ones we have. Otherwise, we increase the risk of diseases, and we lose the biggest buffer we have against climate change. Thank you, XJ. Yeah, I totally agree with Andy. I think you know the, the climate change is particularly important for vector-borne disease, and yeah. uh, you know global warming promotes expansion of those vector-borne disease that were once confined to only those warmer climates. 
And one of the example uh, is the Lyme disease. And uh, you know, since 1991, the Lyme disease has doubled in the United States. And, and some of the typically uh, animals survive in some of the colder uh, temperatures, such as in Canada. And uh, so the temperature strongly mm -hmm. influenced the life cycle of, of deer takes that carry the bacteria cause Lyme disease. So warming temperature associated with the climate change uh, can increase the range of those deer tick habitat, and therefore uh, increasing the potential risk of Lyme disease transmission. So I think the vector prone disease is particularly uh, uh, important uh, uh, associated with the uh, climate change. And, and I agree with, with that. Again, everything that's been said, um, to have something a little different perspective, I'll mention food production. Climate change is really having an impact on food security and food production in some parts of the world. And I already talked about how zoonotic diseases and non-zoonotic diseases of food producing animals are also impacting food production. So I think both of them add to the food production problem. And I'm afraid we've reached the end of our allotted time. Uh, my, my job is to say thank you at this point to our distinguished lecturers. Uh, and also apologies, Andy, that your slides did not fully, uh, weren't shared with the group, but we will be able to, in the video that will be posted, uh, put them in at the appropriate places. So uh, please My look. Apologies uh, that. I have no idea how that happened. Uh, yeah, to, uh, we'll, we'll make sure that the, that the video is, is, is complete. So thank you all again, Dr. Kapwa and our distinguished lecturers. And thank you on behalf of the Charles Valentine Riley Memorial Foundation, the World Food Prize Foundation and the AAAS for just some outstanding insights about prevention of zoonotic diseases with the eye towards preventing the next pandemic. Good afternoon and thank you again. Thank you.